Hey everyone, today we'll be discussing coronary artery disease and some of the implications your patient having coronary artery disease can have on your anesthetic management. To start off, we'll do a quick anatomy review. The entire heart gets its blood supply from the right and left coronary arteries, which both originate at the aortic root to just above the aortic valve. The left coronary artery, or left main, supplies the left atrium, part of the interventricular septum, and the septal, anterior, and lateral walls of the left ventricle. The left main then bifurcates into the left anterior descending, or LAD, and the left circumflex artery. The LAD supplies the septum and anterior walls of the left ventricle, while the circumflex supplies the lateral wall. The right coronary artery supplies the right atrium, most of the right ventricle, and the inferior wall of the left ventricle. On the posterior side of the heart, in most people, the right coronary artery gives rise to the posterior descending artery, which is what supplies the posterior septum and the left ventricle's inferior wall. There are, however, a small percentage of people whose posterior descending artery actually branches off the left coronary artery via the left circumflex instead. Now, as you guys already know, if a patient has coronary artery disease, that means they have impaired coronary blood flow that can precipitate things like myocardial ischemia and infarction, arrhythmias, valvular disorders, and heart failure. You guys also already know that coronary artery disease is not an isolated disease, and these patients usually have some combination of hyperlipidemia, atherosclerosis, hypertension, smoking, and diabetes. So, what are some things to think about when you see coronary artery disease listed on your patient's chart? Well, that answer can actually change a lot depending on their severity of disease and presence of other comorbidities, which makes the quality of your pre-op assessment really important. But no matter what, there are two things to keep in mind that are key to keeping these patients safe while they're under anesthesia. Those two things are maintaining coronary perfusion pressure and maintaining a favorable balance of myocardial oxygen supply and demand. Coronary perfusion pressure for the left ventricle is usually calculated by taking the difference between aortic diastolic pressure and left ventricular and diastolic pressure. For us, that will mostly be in terms of controlling blood pressure and preload. So per the equation, that means a decrease in blood pressure or an increase in preload can severely decrease coronary perfusion pressure. This means we don't want to allow hypotension to go untreated, and we want to be really careful with our fluid administration. Another related thing to remember is that the left ventricle is perfused during diastole, and an increase in heart rate shortens diastolic time, which therefore decreases coronary perfusion. Looking at this graph, you can see that the percentage cardiac cycle time that diastole gets decreases as heart rate increases. Alright, now let's focus on the balance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand. We see ischemia when the heart's oxygen demand is greater than its supply. Some things that increase the heart's demand for oxygen that we definitely want to avoid in these patients include increased heart rate, increased wall tension, which is something that would occur in the presence of increased preload or increased afterload, and increased contractility. That last one is a balance. We don't want to completely depress the myocardium, but we also have to remember that the harder the heart has to work, the higher its oxygen demand will be. On the other side, some things that decrease the oxygen supply to the heart that we want to avoid are increased heart rate because of the decreased filling time we talked about earlier, decreased coronary perfusion, so make sure you avoid hypotension and increased preload, and hypoxemia. Patients with coronary artery disease are at a risk for intraoperative ischemia, and that's obviously something we want to avoid. So here are some recommendations to keep in mind if your patient has coronary artery disease. First, make sure you're doing a really thorough pre-op assessment and preparing accordingly. Take a look at your patient's 12 lead and their echoes and any other diagnostics they've had done. Also make sure you're aware of any resulting disease process they may also have, like arrhythmias, diastolic dysfunction, myocardial infarction, or heart failure. Ask if they've ever had a stent place and when was the last time they had chest pain, and if they've had chest pain, what did they do to relieve it? It's also a good idea to assess their metabolic equivalents, or METs, by asking them about activity tolerance. Then be sure to check when the last time they took medications like beta blockers, other antihypertensives, antiarrhythmics, blood thinners, and PRN nitros. Next, be really vigilant about monitoring for any signs of ischemia by monitoring for T-wave abnormalities, ST changes, and any other changes from their baseline cardiac rhythm. Usually, LEAD2 is best for monitoring for inferior wall ischemia and arrhythmias, while the V5 lead is best for anterior wall ischemia. An arterial line may also be reasonable to have, especially if the patient's coronary artery disease is severe, they have multiple comorbidities like heart failure or aortic stenosis, or if they have multiple cardiac risk factors. Either way, the general rule of thumb is to maintain a blood pressure within 20% of your patient's baseline.
Third, make sure you're limiting sympathetic stimulation so that you can avoid an increase in heart rate. Like we talked about earlier, tachycardia is bad because it decreases blood supply and coronary perfusion time, while also increasing cardiac demand. This means we want to blunt the sympathetic response to stimulation, so keep that in mind during times that are particularly stimulating to your patient, like when you're intubating. Also make sure you're treating pain and anxiety appropriately. Additionally, make sure you're not reaching for drugs that increase heart rate. For example, if your patient's hypotensive, it would be best to grab the phenylephrine or neosinephrine instead of the ephedrine. Using esmolol to treat tachycardia that isn't the result of pain, anxiety, or hypotension is another thing to keep in mind since beta blockers both decrease oxygen demand and increase supply, plus it's also a short-acting medication. Alright guys, that covered your very basic pathophysiology and anesthetic management for patients with coronary artery disease, and I hope it helps you guys all out in the operating room. If you'd like to know more or just check out the resources I've used, they can be found below. Thank you guys for watching!